What's the word, y'all? Y'all ready to talk about the NBA offseason? Oh, this is about to be amazing. I'm about to get hella dramatic, mostly for the click. So, yes, you might have got clickbaited if you knew around here, but I brother got bills to pay, all right? This is about to be the most important offseason in Utah Jazz history. All right, I can't say that for sure. Um, because ask me what they did in the 1996 off season. I, I couldn't I couldn't tell you that might have been the most important one, but it didn't matter because they ended up getting to the finals and losing to Michael Jordan anyway. So no matter what they did, it didn't really matter. But still, this off season is about to be extremely extremely crazy. I'm happy to talk about off season with y'all. We're down to the NBA finals, and now I have enough evidence to talk about this in the video. Let me ramble a little bit because that's what this channel is about. For three straight years, we started this whole ramble series. Me holding the microphone, talking basketball three years ago in the bubble, which is weird to say. Three finals ago, not three years ago. Three finals. Ago. And what I learned is that people want to hear you talk about the first round, second round conference finals, and then once we get down to the last two teams, nobody really cares anymore, which is fine. I'm not a guy that's going to complain about numbers on the second channel, but... I, I, is it surprising to me that we we watch basketball, we talk about basketball every single day on this channel to get to this point where it is the finals and everybody like, eh, you know, eh, we were more more concerned about the conference finals and i'm sure the numbers will get better if somebody gets like embarrassed you know anytime anybody gets embarrassed that's a one to ten for us as content creators you know what i'm saying i'm not rooting for people to get embarrassed don't get me wrong but i'm just saying the numbers look a lot better when the suns get laughed off the court against dallas instead of like a normal series you know what i'm saying uh, but we're starting our off season talk because this weekend something crazy happened well, okay not really crazy but quinn snyder walked away from the utah jazz it felt inevitable that he wasn't going to be the coach next season um i thought it was more going to be a fire because when you're there for eight seasons and six of those seasons you you lose in the playoffs early and then the last year this year you play against a team who's missing their star player for a good chunk of the season or series and you lost changes are going to come within the organization everybody knows the first domino to fall when there is change is the head coach but instead of management instead of ownership saying Quinn you're out the dough I guess Quinn was the one to walk away they it seemed like they begged and pleaded to Quinn Snyder to stay around here because I think we can all agree even though they've had their shortcomings as a as a roster and as a team we can all agree that Quinn Snyder is one of the better coaches in the NBA I don't know if he's number five I don't know if he's number 10 or number 14 but he's one of the better ones you feel me because 15 will make him the average and then he's one of the better coaches in all of basketball but like I said this might be one of the most important seasons off seasons in their history because after he left reports came out that Donovan Mitchell is unsettled unnerved and disappointed and guess who licked their lips every single Knicks fan other than Stephen A. Smith licked their lips because Don knows a New York boy and New York might have assets slash capital to potentially go get the guy to come on home to play in the Mecca there's other teams out there that could potentially have the assets to make these things work and I am a firm believer that the Utah Jazz are not going to trade Donovan Mitchell unless it is the last result you're, you're in Utah Utah does not sign free agents they draft it well I guess they didn't draft well they made it a great draft day trade two of them to get Rudy Gobert who was into the first round to get Donovan Mitchell at 13 ish they made those draft day trades to build this two-man duo that have been all-stars for the last couple seasons and trading that away is going to be tough unless you're getting back a player that you feel comfortable enough is going to be an all-star caliber player Donovan Mitchell if you did not know is a baller <laughs> is an absolute ball I'm watching him and Jamal Murray both drop 50 on each other and once we get to the play Playoffs. He has been a playoff performer in his career. Again, yes, they've had their shortcomings with him as the hot, the top guy. But if I am the ownership over there, I know that our best chance of competence and competence, no, our best chance of being good is through Donovan Mitchell staying on this team. But if bro is unsettled, unnerved, and disappointed, those are the exact words, then things might be getting kind of kind of juicy around here. I thought the domino effects were going to go, um, Quinn Snyder gets fired, Rudy Gobert gets traded, and now Donovan Mitchell's here for at least one more season where he tries to figure out what's going on around him before he either decides that he wants to stay or he walks into the office and say, free me. But you got one of the best young players in the league. People forget that Donovan Mitchell is still, what, 25, 26 years old. He got a lot of experience. He's got his own signature shoe. It's not a lot of players in the NBA that have a signature shoe with a top brand. Because I know I know there's people out there like Matthew Delavadova with a signature shoe. So it don't mean that much, but like with a top brand like Adidas. This is a very marketable, very cool dude. And you don't want to just lose that. You don't want to just trade that away unless it is your last result or, or unless you're getting back a return and you can convince your fans that it was well worth it. But any Utah Jazz fan I've talked to, and it's... Let's be honest, in my life, in my personal life, I don't have a 
I don't know a single person that's a fan of the Utah Jazz. But there is this thing called the internet. And I know some people on the internet that are Utah Jazz fans. They are relatively fed up with these shortcomings. You had seasons where you're the number one team. You've had seasons where you had the three-time defensive player of the year. You've been the number one defense. And you get to the playoffs and boom, everything collapses. Whether it be the players or the coaching or whatever. You collapse, you collapse, you collapse. And it's, it's unfortunate for them because they've had seasons where I was pretty confident in their ability to make a run and they haven't really done that and I would say ownership for the most part has been pretty solid in the sense that they have not been afraid to try to tackle some of the biggest holes when they needed a good point guard they went to get Mike Conley but now they have this huge hole and, and I guess this, this is taken away from my previous statement this huge hole has been there for four seasons now and they still haven't covered it up they have no perimeter defense and and all of that falls back on Rudy Gobert because hey when when your whole goal is to protect the paint and somebody is on the corner you, you well we've had this conversation before Rudy Gobert is not the reason why they've been losing these series but let, actually let me show you some stats and you're like oh Kenny the stats don't mean nothing if I'm watching it in this the stats matter and let me show you <laughs> let me show you this is a Rudy Gobert um fan piece now this is supposed to be about the entire offseason let's just defend Rudy Gobert for 26 minutes and if you go to YouTube and you type in Kenny Rudy Gobert there's a there's a video named Kenny being a Rudy Gobert fan for 29 minutes. Damn, that's a long time to be defending Rudy Gobert. I actually interviewed Rudy Gobert. He's a very cool dude. He followed me back on Twitter, which always is a good sign for me. If I entertain a, a talent for a decent amount that they go out of their way to follow me back, I feel like I was successful. So shout out to Rudy. I'm not defending him because he followed me on Twitter. I just actually watched the basketball. All right, so this is from NBA University. Um, I didn't know I wasn't following you. I got to hit you with that follow. Among bigs who primarily serve as defensive anchor, meaning that they spend a lot of time in drop coverage. This is, uh, we gonna, we going to go through this B-ball index headshot. If you are high on this list, meaning that like the tall portion, you are attacked at the rim a ton. If you are low, then you are avoided at the rim. The further right you go, these are the dudes that finish better, dudes finish better um, against you, and if you're on the left, then people finish worse against you. Okay, cool. Rudy Gobert is in this this bottom left corner, which means that people are afraid to attack him, and when they do, they suck at it. So Rudy Gobert is amazing at his job. Okay, what? Well, why am I defending him right now? I don't know, but I just want to show you that like he's elite. Jaron Jackson Jr. pretty elite too. Eventually, um, players are gonna realize that you should not attack Jaron. This man. Jared Allen is getting attacked and people aren't learning their lesson. So <laughs> these are our top three rim protectors in all of basketball, according to the, the statistics. And j just if you were wondering, once we get over here, um, not not this is not the place you want to be. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying, Nurkic, this is not the place you want to be. Anyway, I thought it was going to go Quinn Snyder, Rudy Gobert, then if it's the last result and, and Donovan Mitchell walks into the office and say, I want out, that would be the last thing. Um, and, and maybe that still is. There were some conversations about what is what is Rudy Gobert's market out there in the league. Uh, I think majority of NBA nerds and NBA people that are in front offices understand the value that can be Rudy Gobert. But then you look at his contract, and I'm one of the biggest Rudy Gobert fans out there. I would not want to be paying, bro, for the next five seasons at that type of clip. He's making money for a guy that can be your go-to scorer. He's making money for a guy that's taking up a huge chunk of your salary cap. And though he might be one of the greatest defensive players this decade, I don't don't know if I want to be the one paying him that if he's almost a zero on offense and don't talk to me about screen assists because I know screen assists are a thing but I've watched teams be six six and shorter against him and he has not made them pay now maybe if you gave him a point guard or somebody that passed him the ball I mean it's a little bit better but still you know like Kevin O'Connor came out with an article and one of his things that he questioned is like what is the market for Rudy Gobert and he talked about or they talked about um, the Toronto Raptors being a team and we we talked about this on my podcast like a month or so ago what the hell do you give up and then there's rumors about OG Ananobi potentially potentially wanting out I, I didn't really read into those rumors too much because there was basically no source other than like when he's playing with Scotty Barnes he plays worse that's not a, that's that doesn't mean he wants out but if he does want out boom there's a perimeter defense but if you are trading Rudy Gobert you're not going to get back the 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 necessary value defensively. And if you're trading Rudy Gobert for whatever the package may be, will that be enough to convince Donovan Mitchell to stay in Utah? Or is it inevitable that you're going to not only have to split this pairing, but reset the whole roster because no matter what you get for Rudy, it will not be enough to satisfy what, what the needs of Donovan Mitchell is. And I, I commend players that have this patience within organizations 
Um, be- because we've seen players, I won't use the word rot because that feels kind of disingenuous. We've seen players be on teams for a, a long time where they believe in their front office. They believe in whatever the coach they are. And like all the fans around them are like, bro, free yourself. It's inevitable, but they're not going to get you a championship caliber team. And I, I might be going towards that with, with Donovan, with Donovan Mitchell, if I'm being honest. After all of this broke, Bleach Report slash Andy Bailey put up top landing spots for Jazz as Donovan Mitchell. Mitchell if Utah trades star guard I like to set if they trade them because again it is a it is a very big if him being oh what is the wording again unsettled unnerved and disappointed could just be and I think they're talking about it even here this is Kevin O'Connor's piece over at the ringer um it could just be because he didn't see this coming or he just is curious of what the hell is about to happen next you know I would be unsettled if my head coach dropped out even if I wanted to stay so Again, not looking too much into that, but those are some some really good words that made uh, NBA Twitter talk. So I have not looked at this article from Andy Bailey, so let's figure out what the top landing spots for Donovan Mitchell would be if he decided to request a trade. Um, and then he give you right there what's going on. Okay, we knew that the Knicks were going to be on this list, and they are saying R.J. Barrett, Emmanuel Quickly, Evan Fournier in a 2024 first-round pick. Okay, and I, I'm trying to think about it from what does this mean for the future of our team? What does this mean for our, our fans Will they be excited if we got back this package? Or do we believe that we have some pieces that are going to be building blocks for us to potentially win a championship five years, ten years down the line? Do we believe that the pieces that we get back are valuable enough to maybe trade later to get something big? Like, you have to think not just one step ahead, two steps ahead. And if that is what I'm doing with this trade, I am not a huge fan of it. RJ looks like he's going to be pretty good, even though the advanced stats and the finishing stats and the three-point stats don't look great. The I, t- I think you got to do both, by the way. I test and like the stats. The I test when I watch RJ looks like he, he's a real good hooper if you allow him to be RJ. But even with that, even with quickly, even with Evan Fournier in his 2024 first round pick, I'm not excited. I feel like this is a trade. He's like, oh, we got to do something. And that's the something that you're going to do. I think that you can get a bigger and better package from the Knicks if they are desperate. I don't know if they will be desperate because Leon Rose and company over there haven't really been desperate since they've, you know, taken over the, the New York Knicks. But if they become desperate and they know that Donovan Mitchell wants to be there, that's how you get teams getting super finessed. When Donovan Mitchell says he wants, when Donovan Mitchell says he wants to go there, there is a world, and I'm thinking about like the Carmelo Anthony trade, which is still the Knicks. Everybody knew that he wanted to go there. The Knicks overpaid to make it a reality, but we've also seen times where a player has a short list of three teams, and now the team that that wants that player is using that as ammo. Like you can't trade him to any of these other teams. We are your only option. So it could go either way. It can go either way. Number two is the Miami Heat. This is the one that's gonna come out a bunch, especially when you have Bradley Beal. Donovan Mitchell, just anybody that can score the ball in the half court, the Miami Heat are going to be attached to it because Tyler Hero wants a bag this offseason. Duncan Robinson was has $54 million guaranteed left on his contract, and he didn't even play in the playoffs. Omar Yurtseven showed flashes in the minutes that he was given, and then two first-round picks. I'm being completely honest with you. If, the, if I'm the Miami Heat and this is on the table and the Utah Jazz are interested, I am doing this 100% of the time and I think it's mostly because I can't say I won't use the word I'm not convinced on Tyler Hero because that even that feels weird but the ceiling of Tyler Hero and I know I'm talking about a kid that is only a couple years into the into his career so I it'll be it's weird to talk about ceilings but it feels like the ceiling of Tyler Hero won't hit what the ceiling of Donovan Mitchell is and you think about the age that is Kyle Lowry you think about the age that is Jimmy Butler you need to accelerate this you're one game away from being in the finals with with Tyler Hero not being there these are three players that did not play for you this playoff run basically and we can replace that and get back Dono who be dropping 50s I'm not worried about the defense because you just had Tyler Hero and Duncan Robinson get minutes in the regular season and you were one of the top defenses in the league I'm not worried about that I'm not worried about that Jimmy's still gonna defend Kyle is still gonna defend to the most part and then Bam is one of the best seven five to seven defenders in all the basketball so I wouldn't worry about that but I don't know if I'm the Utah Jazz that this is enough to get me happy this is going to be crazy. I think the Utah Jazz fans would be interested to get this package. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. Number three, Atlanta goes all in. John Collins, DeAndre Hunter, a first-round pick, or two first-round picks, including the 2022. I don't know what the 2022 pick is for the Atlanta Hawks. I don't know where that ended up being. Are you going to tell me in the article? They're not going to tell me. Um, but it's it's not high, but it's not low. It is somewhere in that middle because they, you know what I'm saying, disappointed, but they weren't the worst team in basketball. John Collins, DeAndre Hunter, 
and two first round picks is interesting um i don't know who the hell scores for the utah jazz there this this trade for me is if we have decided to trade um rudy gobert and donovan mitchell that's what this trade is for me. I think DeAndre Hunter is a stud, bro. Just has to somehow get and stay healthy. Uh, we saw that in his last game where they got eliminated. He actually played his ass off, but he has to get healthy. Same thing with John Collins. He was dealing with injuries all season. I think it was a hand injury at the end of it. These are two players that can absolutely ball, but I don't know if I could convince my fans that these two are the replacement for Donovan Mitchell unless you're telling them, hey, we're hitting a full reset. These are two building blocks for that reset. But then again, John Collins, it's not like he on a rookie deal. They extended him. I don't know. Last one is that wild card from Indy. Mm, Malcolm Brogdon, Buddy healed a first-round pick, a pick swap, and a first-round pick. The, the 2022 first-round pick is what? Number seven? I don't know. What number pick is this? Oh, I, I, wish, I wish I knew things a little bit better. This is a top 10 pick. Let's just say that. The 2022 pick, you got Malcolm Brogdon and Buddy Heald that can help you compete for, compete for a playoff spot. While also having one of the top picks in this year's draft, you got the swap and then you got the unprotected 2024. If, oh, and you're giving up Royce O'Neal. If I'm the Indiana Pacers, I do this 100% of the time. Can you convince Donovan Mitchell that this is a better place to play than Utah? Uh, that is that is the real question. I've never been to Utah, so I can't talk about the culture of the uh, the arena or the city around uh, or in Salt Lake City. But I know in Indy, they ride for their players. I've been there a couple different times, and it felt like a college basketball game in the best possible way. It felt like I was in a coliseum, and even though this team wasn't very good, the time that I went, it was it felt great. Um, so I, I don't know. I would pull the trigger if I'm Indy. I don't think I pull the trigger if I'm the Jazz. And that's what I mean, though. We just saw four trades from a credible author um out there who put together good articles here and there and yet i didn't see a single trade that i would be extremely excited about if i was the utah if i were the owner of the utah jazz or danny ainge the guy over there um so i'm very interested to see what happens this offseason who's going to be the new head coach uh people keep asking me if you were you know hiring right now who would you look for I am big on coaches that haven't got a chance to be head coaches just yet. I feel like there's just so many different assistant coaches just sitting on the sideline of some organizations that deserve a chance. And I'm just looking at recent history. I mean, if you get the right guy, that first year coach could change the entire culture, the entire dynamic of an, of an organization. And one of the reasons Quinn Snyder stepped down, he said that he believed that the team needed change. And one of the changes is not bringing in Terry Stotts or bringing in Mike D'Antoni. You know, I think the change can be a fresh face and a fresh voice. So let me know what you think about the Utah Jazz and their upcoming offseason. Um, and I'll be in that comment section. Appreciate you. Peace.